Good evening and welcome everybody and those of you viewing this at a later stage on our <laughs> YouTube channel. Um, you're all very welcome. Um, our next Razoom will be in July the 23rd where we've got Christian Moinston uh, presenting on E. Callisto. However, tonight we've got Peter East. And I have to say, I first came across Peter at a uh, Sarah conference. I think it was maybe 18 or 19. And I thought then, this is incredible what an independent researcher can do. I was just bowled over and so impressed. And then lo and behold, earlier in the year, I saw Peter's name pop up. And I thought one day I'll grab him to do a presentation one Friday evening. And lo and behold, tonight is that Friday. So Peter, you're very welcome. Thank you for preparing for tonight and, uh, and presenting to us. As I've said before, our monitors are yours. Over to you, Peter. Okay, well, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Oh, yes. Hello? Yep. Yep. Well, thanks very much. Um, um, shall I share my screen straight away? Um, should be possible. Should be possible. Um, we're nearly there. Share screen right in the middle. Okay. Right, okay. Good. Right, we, that's it, you got it there? Oh yeah. <coughs> right. <clears throat> well, actually I've got to thank Paul straight away for my the title of this uh, talk um, <clears throat> on the tricky question of pulsars. I wouldn't have thought that up myself because pulsars uh, from uh, coming at it from somebody with modest means and a small garden, uh, so you can only have a small antenna, you'll find pulsars very tricky to detect, even trickier to recognize in your data. But the trickiest part is proving that you've actually uh, got a, uh, a pulsar. <clears throat> so what I'm going to do tonight, what I've planned, is to tell you, uh, explain what a pulsar is, uh, why they're so tricky and how to go about detecting them from uh, building the hardware and, uh, and getting the software. <clears throat> Probably most of you know this, but uh, pulsars are uh, actually neutron stars, which are the collapsed core of a supernova. And uh, they're about 10 to 15 miles across. Um, as the core collapses, it preserves the rotational and magnetic energies, and so they rotate very fast and have very high magnetic fields. And as they rotate, the, uh, they accelerate electrons and protons um, out of the magnetic poles, both magnetic poles, uh, to send out a wide band electromagnetic energy. They, uh, one of those beams happens to pass through the solar system, then we can detect them as pulsars. They were first discovered in 1967 by uh, Jocelyn Bell, who was uh, operating a 16,000 square meter array of 2,000 dipoles at 80 megahertz. And she was looking for quasars and she found these what she called little green men. And uh, it in fact was the very first pulsar and it has a period of one and a third seconds and a pulse width, <coughs> excuse me, of 34 uh, milliseconds. So we're after detecting them. So what characteristics of pulsars can we look for? And uh, they're usually very low duty cycle, one to 5% duty cycle, with a very high stability. The, they are uh, very highly stable clocks. Uh, they do spin down 
and uh, give up all of their energy, which they're transmitting as electromagnetic energy. And uh, they take about 100 million years, but they are extremely stable. The rotation rate that we measure is shifted by uh, the Doppler motion of the Earth around the sun, um, but we can usually, um, there is software to tell us what actual rotation rate we can see. They transmit broadband noise, which is stronger at lower frequencies, which is something I found out late in the day. Uh, some of them are polarized, some linearly polarized, some circularly polarized, and the polarization may rotate within the pulse, uh, but you've got to be a very keen observer uh, to afford two receivers to measure the, those polarizations. So we usually only measure just one. <clears throat> the signal is dispersed. That means that the lower frequencies arrive after the higher frequencies. And this is due to interaction with free electrons on the path. Uh, they scintillate like mad uh, in both amplitude, in time, and in frequency. Um, I'll show you a bit of that later. And they're very weak compared to other radio astronomy sources. Um, <clears throat> sorry, this is the uh, a single scan of the Vela pulsar, which is the most powerful pulsar that we that has been intercepted. Uh, it's in the southern hemisphere, so we can't see it up here. Um, and what you see is the integrated uh, pulse profile. Uh, this is 500 seconds. It rotates in 89 milliseconds. Um, so there are uh, probably about uh, 10 or 20 rotations. Uh, this was collected by a 30 meter dish and using a, a two meg RTL SDR. The signal to noise ratio, I'll be talking about that quite a bit in this talk. Um, the way that is uh, described is it's the peak signal level divided by the standard deviation of the base noise. And it's a voltage ratio. <clears throat> There's a story behind this. This measurement was made at 14, 20 megs. And that followed some work I was doing at, um, on the hydrogen line. And I was, uh, after I discovered the RTL SDR, I built a hydrogen line receiver and I did some work in the hydrogen line. And at that time, I was collaborating uh, with a young uh, technician in uh, the Argentine Institute of Radio Astronomy, Guillermo, Guillermo Gancio. And he was setting to work his 30 meter dish and he made some superb recordings of the hydrogen line. And about that time, I was I joined SARA and there, on the SARA forum, there was a, a big discussion going on about the possibility or impossibility of amateurs detecting pulsars. And so I took the opportunity and I wrote to Guillermo and I said, could you point your dish at the Vela pulsar and collect some measurements with your RTL SDR? Uh, at 14, 20 megs, and then we can do the calculations to work out just what you do need uh, to detect, what an amateur needs to detect the uh, a pulsar. <clears throat> so he did that and he sent me the data. And at the that time I was very green and I didn't know an awful lot about pulsars. I uh, wrote some uh, folding so uh, software uh, to recover the pulse, and but you have to get the pulsar period exactly right. And I mentioned earlier about the Doppler shift of the Earth's motion. So I had to try hundreds of different values. And then suddenly this popped out and it was really, truly exciting. And anyway, we, we, I, we took this data, I measured it, did the calculations, and worked out that an amateur needed at least a three meter dish uh, integrated for about three hours and needed 
between five and 10 megahertz RF bandwidth. And if you did all that, you get a pulse about a tenth of this size. <clears throat> what I didn't realize at that time was that 1420 megs, whilst it was good for the RTL and opportune, I didn't realize that there was a lot more power at 400 megahertz. But anyway, we uh, oh, to, to continue, this is uh, showing you some uh, what scintillation looks like. This is a recording of BO329. It's a recording from a 46 meter dish at the Stanford Research Institute. I've been collaborating with a scientist there. And he sent me this data in April. And with luck, I'm going to try to see whether we can we can play it. I might have to do this twice. No, it's not going to work. Ah, yes. Can you hear that? Yes. Good. There are actual pulses that arrived in April, uh, but they were sent out by the BO329 pulsar about 3,500 years ago. Okay, so we'll come out of that. And I've got something else to show you. Let me show. Uh, that's a single pulse. I could show you a few more, but I don't think I'd better. I think I'd better get back. Right, okay. Um, where do pulsars fit in the, uh, the normal range of radio astronomy targets? Um, we've got a bit plot here, you've probably seen before, uh, frequency along the uh, x-axis and flux in Janskis on the left-hand axis. And you can see that a Jansky is a, is a mighty small number. Um, the sun is up at about 10 to the 7, Janskis, Cassiopeia, Cygnus, uh, Taurus A, that's the Crab Nebula. Uh, you know, there's a pulsar in the Crab Nebula, uh, but the pulsar is way down here. Uh, this is the, um, I don't think it's very accurate, is gives you an idea of the uh, BO329 and um, uh, sort of level. On the right hand side is, I, I put a list, a label there in degrees Kelvin per meter squared. And this is the equivalent temperature that you see of the, uh, the flux on the left hand side. And of course we have RFI, the other sources, cars, computers, mobile. Um, somebody mentioned earlier on about nighttime work. I've collected my best data at night time when people aren't mowing their lawns and doing any DIY. <coughs> uh, quickly show you the, uh, the Lorimer Kramer pulsar radi radiometer equation. Uh, this is the signal to noise ratio that you'll measure on the left. Uh, this is the flux from the ATNF database. Uh, this is the your receiver effective aperture, the RF bandwidth and the integration time and your system temperature. And on the right hand side, it's multiplied by the square root term of the pulsar period divided by the pulsar width. And if you do the sums for BO329, you'll find that at 400 megahertz, you, the signal to noise ratio you receive will be 3.4 to one per meter squared per root megahertz per root hour. 
So two hours, two megahertz, one meter squared, you'll get a signal to noise ratio of 6.8 to 1. Uh, 400, uh, 1400 megs, it's a seventh of this. So you do need a much bigger aperture. For those who don't like equations, I've actually plotted the data here. Uh, the red curve is for the Vela pulsar, and the bottom curve is for BO329. And this is the signal to noise ratio you'll see for this effective aperture. For a system temperature of 100 degrees Kelvin and with an RTL bandwidth of 2.4 megahertz. So you can see with the one and a half meter squared aperture, you should get a 10 to one signal to noise ratio with BO329 and 20 to one with Vela. So the southern hemisphere, people are a bit more advantageous to us. <clears throat> what these curves actually do is, I've assumed a drift scan mode. So whatever effective aperture I've got here, I've had an equivalent beam width. I've pointed the antenna at the, at the pulsar and just let it drift through. And so to, to get these plots, uh, so the wider, the less the effective area, the wider the beam width, so the longer it has on the target. And there's also some compensation there for the fact that the over the 3 dB beam width, the beam, the signal received is dropped by 3 dB at either, at, at either end. So a modern pulsar radio telescope looks like this, an antenna, a low noise amplifier, an essential filter, RF chain, a software defined radio, and a PC to collect the data. The data comes in binary files in a complex form, R and Q. And then this you feed into some software processing that uh, gets rid of some of the RFI, de-disperses the signal, detects it, integrates and fold it, and presents it to you. So it's quite a simple sort of system. There are several options for antennas for people who have um, a small uh, a small backyard. Uh, a horn is 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 quite a good one. This is Rishi Patel's um, a horn of plenty, I think they call it, for uh, the hydrogen line. Um, for uh, 400 megs, uh, you'll keep a similar sort of aperture, say one and a half meters by one and a half meters, or one meter by a meter, uh, but it will need to be uh, two or three meters long to get a good um, launch into space. Uh, you can make them with aluminized polystyrene, um, but they're still, they're, they're lightweight, but they're still a bit bulky to carry around, but they are quite efficient. <clears throat> There's the dish, of course. The bigger dish you can afford, the better, without a doubt. Uh, I've shown an offset dish here because it is it gives less um, obscuration <clears throat> and it helps a bit with um, uh, uh, side lobes. Um, but most dishes are, are quite inefficient. You're lucky to get 50% of the area. <clears throat> the Yagi's got a lot going for it because it's lightweight. Uh, you can make it yourself um, and you can <clears throat> easily move them about and point them and store them. Uh, the problem with them is that they do have high side loads. And as you'll see later on, that can cause a problem. Um, uh, there are some proven low side lobe antennas. Uh, we have a friend in Italy who has made both of these types of antennas and had some excellent results. This is a 3D corner reflector antenna. Um, this is the, uh, the launch probe and it sends a beam up at 45 degrees relative to this base. Um, <clears throat> the problem is it's, it's frequency limited. Um, the maximum gain 
comes when these sides are about three lambda. So it has a, a finite area, which is frequency dependent. But at 400 megs, it's two and a half meters squared. At 600 megs, it's 1.2 meters squared. The other one is the double bicord, and that's similarly uh, frequency limited. And the aperture there is about 1.7 lambda squared, and it's about two lambda long by one lambda wide. Uh, you could, and it has 0.8 meter squared uh, effective aperture. You can double this by making a, a quad by quad. And, uh, and I don't know if anybody's tried that, uh, but that's worthwhile doing, I think. But if you build your own antenna, you've got to set it up. Um, it's important that the match is right. Uh, there are lots of budget vector analyzers on eBay uh, for quite modest prices. And you can, uh, you can check them and set them up. And, and I've used these very successfully, uh, matching a pair of, of uh, Yardi antennas. <clears throat> We're very lucky with amplifiers. Uh, when I was working, there was no way you'd get an amplifier with this sort of performance that we get for between five and 15 pounds now. Um, <clears throat> we're, we're lucky because a lot of development has gone on with um, our mobile phones. <clears throat> and so we've got um, very low noise, very wide band amplifiers. And these bottom ones for eBay, and you'll get that one for five pounds and that one for 15 pounds. Uh, but to go, I, I've always gone for a decent mini circuits amplifier for the front end low noise amplifier. Mine is 0.4 dB and it's uh, uh, effect equivalent is 28 degrees, uh, but they're over a hundred pounds. Uh, so you don't want to buy too many of them. Uh, because those amplifiers are so wide band, we're talking about 50 megs to four gigs, you really do need a, a very good filter. And I've gone for this, um, what they call interdigital filter. <coughs> it looks complex, but there are lots of design details on the web. Um, basically it's uh, one inch by six mil sides, um, six mil copper rods, uh, six, millim six millimeter bolt tuning bolts and uh, aluminium plate top and bottom. Everything screwed together with self tapping screws. You can make that in a day and it has extremely good performance. Once again, you can get test equipment, a spectrum analyzer and a noise source uh, for about 110 pounds. <coughs> comes with software so you can see the display. Uh, these are um, eBay filters, they are tri-band filters that I bought. That's one, that's two in series. And this is the performance of my interdigital filter. And the drop band there is 50 dB in three megs. And at this sort of region, there are lots of TV channels. So you really do need a sharp cut off there. It's been very successful. And of course, now we come to the superb RTL2832U. Uh, you probably know that it was originally designed as a digital TV um, a dongle. <clears throat> a couple of clever chaps wrote drivers for it to turn it into a, an SDR tunable from 25 to 1750 megs. It outputs 8-bit IQ samples at a clock rate up to 2.4 megahertz. People have um, extended this a bit and there's plenty of software available. <clears throat> it has its limitations, but I put together four of these in a quad RTL for my uh, Pulsar work and I've taken them out of the boxes. These are the four RTLs. Um, Alone, they drift in frequency and they drift in gain. Um, 
So what I've done here is to take the crystals out. And in this unit, I've got a temperature compensated crystal driving a CMOS driver, which drives, uh, which feeds them all uh, in, in phase. And, uh, uh, and also uh, to cope with the, the temperature drip, I've put heat sinks on all of the components and put it all in a box with four fans which keep it at ambient temperature. Uh, that doesn't solve all the problems because when they actually recall data, they take more power than when they're not recording data. Uh, so the way to use them is to have them switched on recording data. And when you're ready to do a real recording, switch them off and switch them on again. They all come on, uh, because they're controlled from that switch, uh, controlled by the computer, they all come off at slightly different times, just a few milliseconds. And so uh, to overcome that, I switch a noise source, um, a modulated noise source in front of them for 10 seconds. And then when I've recorded the data, I can then uh, correlate them and get them all in phase. You don't need to go to all that trouble. You can buy an AirSpy or there's HackRF. There are lots of these um, SDRs available now. I'm in fact using AirSpy now. The tuning rate to get the, the best um, integration of your pulse arm, uh, you really do need the clock accuracy uh, to be very high. A half of pulse, uh, 0.5 <laughs> um, parts per million sounds good, but uh, you'll still have to do a bit of tuning. Um, so I've invested in a GPS disciplined oscillator. Uh, this is excellent. It tunes from 450 to 800 megs from SDR kits. It's very reasonably priced. It outputs, it can output two signals anywhere in this frequency range um, in phase. Uh, so you can use it for interferometry. Uh, for my SDRs, I tune it to 28.8 megs and bypass the uh, temperature compensated crystal oscillator. For the air spy, uh, which already is, is supposed to be very, uh, very good, I, you can lock it with a 10 megahertz signal. So this is your system. Uh, you choose your own air antenna, whatever you can get in your garden. This is the 30 meter dish uh, in Argentina. Um, these are the amplifiers, the filters I showed you going into the RTL, into a, a PC. Um, this does need a couple of hundred um, gigs spare memory. Uh, and that produces the, uh, the, the data record. And uh, a, a Netherlands pulse arm Hunter has produced what he calls his 3PT tools. And so you can take this RTL data, uh, set up a configuration control uh, file telling you what the parameters are and it will produce, it will fold the data and do a, a frequency waterfall and a, a, a time waterfall and a frequency waterfall. So you can check your data very quickly. So that's all there is to it. But you've built up your system, you've got to test it. There's a bit of software, SDR Sharp, which um, will drive most SDRs. And you can use this to check through your system, check the gain through it and so on, that everything is, um, is as you designed. To check the sensitivity, uh, you can do this very simply if you've got a small antenna and you can get at the antenna terminal. What you do is you point your antenna at the sky, in the cold sky, uh, probably at the North Pole or something like that. 
or switch it to a 50 ohm load at ambient temperature. And then you take those two voltages that you've measured, you divide the 50 ohm voltage by the sky voltage, subtract one, divide that into 290, and that gives you a very rough guide of your system temperature. To find out what your, the radiometer sensitivity is, you take the system temperature and you do this calculation, divide it by the observation time times the RF bandwidth times the pulsar pulse width divided by the pulsar period. And you get a, can you see that? You find that this sensitivity is 0.207 of degree. You then go to looking at the what the equivalent temperature of the pulsar will be. And you can get this figure from the ATNF database. And that comes to 0.06 of a degree Kelvin per meter squared. And then you divide this number by this number to get the expected signal to noise ratio. To find out where to point the antenna and when your pulsar is going to come into your beam width, you do need radio eyes. It costs money, but it's worth it. Uh, you can tell it your elevation and azimuth beam widths, and it will plot that on the screen at the point and direction that you, you need. And it will also tell you for B10329 when it will come in your come within your beam. So you can time it as it goes into your beam and out of your beam so that you can set up the parameters you need for uh, recording data. Uh, that's B0329. And these are one hour period. So one, two, three, about three and a half hours it will start to come in the beam. So you can do all your timings in this way. So we've recorded our data and now we've got to start processing it. What does it look like? Um, <clears throat> from the receiver, we've set up this binary file from the SDR, which outputs I and Q parts. And then digitally, we square and add these to effectively do a detection and pass it through a low pass filter. And then you'll see something like this. This is real data that I've actually collected. Uh, this, the, the DC level, is proportional to your system temperature plus the sky temperature. And the pulsars are within this on a regular basis. Um, we saw with the 46 meter dish that you will actually see pulses here. Um, in this, you won't, with, with a, a small system, you won't see any pulses. Um, uh, to give you an idea, uh, the RMS level of noise, we come out here with a, a one kilocycle uh, sample rate. Uh, this is about two degrees RMS, which means that's about 12 degrees from top to bottom, temperature wise. And we saw earlier on that our pulsar was about 0.06 of a degree. So we're not likely to see it in there, but it, it'll be a, a guide to tell you that uh, you're on the right track. So to grab it out of the noise, we have this folding algorithm. Basically what the folding algorithm does is it takes your data record, this is your data record, and digitally you chop it up into exact periods so that the pulsar, if it's present, will appear in the same place relative to the edge in every period. And there'll be about 10 to 15,000 of these. To get an accurate period, you resort to a program called Tempo. Uh, it's available for both Windows and Linux. And you give it your latitude and longitude. 
and the UTC of the time you're going in and the pulsar you're interested in, and it will give you an exact value for this. In any case, once you've chopped it up into all these periods, you add them all together, as I've shown here. The pulsar adds linearly, and the noise adds as the power, so adds as the square root. And so the sigma's noise ratio improves as the number of folds, <coughs> as the square root of the number of folds. And from this, you can work out, uh, you, uh, you, you, fr from this, you get a plot of the, your pulsar within the noise. The software you need is, uh, as I've already spoken about, SDR Sharp. That's available from AirSpy. Um, I've put a lot of links in this talk, which you can probably get if you look at the uh, recording. Um, the, the, to extract data from the RTL, um, Osmocom have produced a set of RTL tools. Uh, the one I've used is RTL SDRX. For Windows, you'll need the Zadig driver. Uh, and all the information comes from Osmocom and SDR. And to do the Pulsar processing, I've already told you about Michael Clarson's uh, 3PT tools. Uh, they're freely available on his website. Um, <clears throat> I guess the, the pioneers of 400 meg pulsar hunting is Andrea and his son Giorgio Delimagin in um, Italy. He's produced lots of software. And, and this one is uh, a, lot of, a, a lot of people are using this software now. Uh, you need Linux, um, <clears throat> but uh, if you talk to him nicely, he might supply you with a, a Linux on a, a disk or something so that you can just drop it in and it'll just work. You don't need to know much about Linux. And on my site, I've got a few uh, C programs, CX programs, um, or uh, D-Disperse and, 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 uh, and folding and so on. Uh, nowadays, a lot of people are going for G, uh, GNU radio. And in fact, um, Andrea's software uh, uses GNU radio. Uh, to display your result, you can use um, a number of different programs. And in fact, um, Anaconda uh, 3 has got Python and it runs AstroPy. And there are programs so that you can get the um, accurate period data from this. So you can have that on your, on your own computer. <coughs> the professionals use a, a number of programs. Tempo, I've spoken about. Presto, I'll talk a lot about. And PSR Archive, SIGPROP and DSPR. They all run on Linux and they're available as well. And there's a lot of information that you can get on um, uh, on this uh, site. So there's a lot of software, hardware's easy, and let's see what people have achieved. Um, gone back to some plots again. This curve is for a 422 meg system with a 10 meg air spy and a 100 degree uh, system noise temperature. Uh, this is the same with, the blue is the same with an RTL and the red dot and the blue dot is what um, Andrea Delimagin has achieved. With this, with his 0.8 square meter uh, dual biquad and this with his 3D um, corner reflector. Uh, the green curve is at 611 megahertz and six meg bandwidth and 175 degree system noise temperature. And this happens to be my effort. And this is what I've achieved. At the bottom here is uh, equivalent for 1420 megahertz. Um, and so you can see quite clearly, even with an 80 degree Kelvin, 
and a six megahertz RF, um, you still don't get a decent signal to noise ratio. So you need a few square more, more square meters and certainly a bit more time. And because the beam width is so narrow, you'll need to track over a sort of three hour period. So this is Andrea Delimagin's um, setup. This is his 3D corner reflector. As I say, it's pointed up because um, uh, pointing at uh, BO329. He had a new automatic observatory running for a couple of years. It ran every day and produced results. And if you go on his um, website, um, you will you'll see his daily records. Uh, this is typical of the sort of performance he had with a signal to noise ratio of about 14 to one. Uh, this is a picture of his site and this is the, um, uh, the, the link to it. Uh, you can see here, uh, this is a, a time multiple. This is a period of three hours and you can see the scintillation you get bursts of good pulses, and the result is this. The big problem at the end of the day is validating the signal. Um, that looks pretty good, but people have been fooled by uh, spikes, noise spikes and things like that. So you really do need to go to validating. And uh, the trend is for amateurs now to use Press the Presto. Presto is a package written by uh, Scott Ransom. It's Pulsar Exploration and Search Toolkit. It was really designed to search for new pulsars, <clears throat> although it has got some analysis capability. And it has discovered over a thousand pulsars. So this is what the, the prep poll tool, which is the folding tool, looks like. Um, the data that you collect, this is the 14 to one signal to noise ratio um, that from Andrea's uh, site. Um, here we have a, a time waterfall. And I think if you squint your eyes, you can just see a trace here and a trace there. This is the same thing uh, repeated um, so that if the pulsar happened to appear there, you would still see it. This is the frequency waterfall, and I think you can see the lines are a bit clearer here. What these lines tell us is that it is a pulse train that we're receiving. What these lines here on the frequency waterfall tell us is that it is broadband. Now, there are two factors that uh, tell us that it, it could be a pulsar. <coughs> uh, this is a period scan. What he does here is to have an accurate period and you get a maximum. And if you change the period, change the block uh, length, then the, uh, the period doesn't quite match. And so the amplitude goes down. So what we expect to see is a peak at zero and a roll up either side. Uh, this one is a PDOT search. Now PDOT is the period rate search. So what you're looking for here is to see if there is any spin down. If there's any spin down it, and you, over this sort of time period, then it's not a pulsar. So once again, you expect a peak at zero and a roll up either side. Uh, <clears throat> this Pretty plot here is a period search and the P dot search together. So it's a, a two dimensional plot. And what you expect to see here is a, a peak in the middle and, and maybe a, a, a sloping line here. Uh, this is probably the most important one. This is the dispersion measure search. So what we do here is to speed the low frequencies up and the high frequencies down so that they all arrive together and you get a maximum. And the maximum occurs at the correct dispersion measure. Now the dispersion measure value is dependent upon how far the pulsar is away and what the 
free electron density is in the path. Um, so it's a fixed figure and it must agree for 27. And so what this tells you is that it's a, um, an interstellar source. It's not a terrestrial source. So that's a pass on validation. <clears throat> so the profile tells us that we've got the right pulse width. The time waterfall tells us that it's a scintillating pulse train. The frequency waterfall tells us that it's wide band. The DM plot tells us it's an extraterrestrial source. The period search says it's an accurate match, match period. The p-dot search said there's negligible spin down. The period p-dot search shows that we have time in correlation. So those seven features combined all tell you that it is a pulsar. And so you can regard it as being validated. I've said it works for large signals to noise ratios. This is my system. And I only get a signal to noise ratio of four and a half to one. I won't go into too much detail in this because I'm running out of time. <clears throat> if I run this through um, Presto, I can't see anything here. I can't see anything there. I can't, there's a flat line there, flat line there, flat line there. And this figure here, uh, it, I should have pointed this one out. This is a measure of the, uh, the signal strength, the, of, of it growing in time. I and mean, you should expect to see a rising curve there. And in fact, it's kind of going down. So it's a fail. So we can't use that. So I <clears throat> set about, my work has been set about looking at finding, uh, getting more analytical detail of the, of, a, of the pulsar and the noise. And I've set up this nine point criteria. And if it passes all of those, then I can be persuaded that it is the right signal. So this is test one, which is a simple fold. <clears throat> now you can't get better than the folding algorithm. You know, this, the folding algorithm can't be beaten with any other approach. Um, and I'll tell you the reason why, <clears throat> why it can't. This, there, there's a 714 points here. The original data was 145 gigabytes. So out of that 145 gigabytes of data, I've ended up with 700 points. One of them looks like a pulsar, but the noise pipes peaks also could look like a pulsar. And that could be just a big noise peak. <clears throat> Spectrum techniques aren't, don't tell you any more because the reason is, is that all of these peaks occupy the same harmonics as a true pulsar does. So you can't separate these frequency wise. So the test that we look at is to split the data in half, fold each half separately, overlap one on the other, and hopefully you get a response in both halves. So in this case, we do get a response in both halves, uh, but you do with these noise peaks as well. It gets rid of a few other noise peaks, but not all of them. But that tells you that it, you have got a pulse train in both halves. Uh, the next common test is to do a two section fold. So you break it up into two, sec, two, two periods rather than one period, and then stack the two periods on one another. So you should get a, a, an amplified pulse here and an amplified pulse here. And uh, to check that, I cut them up and overlay one on the other. That's why they're all the same color. So once again, they come there. And that tells us that their pulses do occur sequentially. So this is another confirming point that it is a pulse train. But once again, some of these noise peaks do the same. Um, a stronger test is the subband RF plan plot. We've got three bands. In this case, a red, a blue, and a green. Once again, they overlap together. But now if you look at these other areas, 
where there was a bit of ambiguity, um, only two out of three there. And in this one, uh, they, are, they are much smaller. <clears throat> so it's not a positive test, it's a confirming test. It is a wide band source. Now I've gone a lot further and I won't go into this too much detail in looking at period search properties. Um, <clears throat> as you change the period uh, by a small part per million, then what happens is, is that the pulses don't arrive at the same point relative to the beginning, they get spread out. So what happens is the pulse gets spread out, which is the reason why the amplitude goes down. Now you can work out, you can assume that this is a Gaussian pulse, or you can even take the real pulse and you can work out precisely how much wider the pulse is gonna get and how far the amplitude goes down. So then we can do that in real, real life and we can see that that happens. It doesn't happen with noise. Um, P dot search is similar, it's a bit more complicated, but we can, uh, we still get a similar sort of effect. We can predict exactly how far the peak moves and how, how wide it gets. Uh, so these are much stronger com confirming uh, tests. And the final one is the dispersion search. And once again, the, the lower frequencies come after the higher frequencies. So uh, if you slow the higher frequencies down and speed the lower frequencies up, they all combine to give you a peak pulse. Uh, if you let them spread out, the pulse gets wider, the amplitude gets less. And once again, you can predict the amplitude drop and the width increase. And you can see that happening here. Uh, there's a, as you get a low signal to noise ratio, uh, the baseband noise starts interfering, uh, but the first two are, are quite clear. The other thing you can do is to copy Presto. And that's what I've done here. So I've used, instead of using the chi squared statistic that they've used, I've used signal to noise ratio. And here is the uh, just a single scan of my uh, 4.8 to 1 signal to noise ratio. Uh, this is the time waterfall and you can see the red there is the pulse appearing. You can see that the uh, as the as I accumulate the uh, the folding uh, towards the end then it is rising. Uh, if I look at the the three band frequency um, I get responses in all three bands, showing that it's wide band. Uh, the period search plot uh, gives me a peak at the center. The P dot plot gives me a peak at the center. The dispersion measure gives me a peak at 27. And the period um, P dot search gives me what we expect expected from that 14 to 1 uh, signal to noise ratio. Okay, so I'm assuming that that is now passed. So both my nine points, although I only told you about eight, and the uh, Presto uh, mimicking plot uh, both agree. So the system requirements for success are to go for low frequencies, a low side, low, side low band antenna, uh, my Yagis were very bad. I had a 175 degree system noise temperature, um, but my amplifier was only 28 degrees. And all of that came from the side lobes. In fact, near my house, um, the, uh, the horizon was about plus 30 degrees. And with a and, and that's and the horizon is all everything below the horizon is at ambient temperature. Uh, so I reckon I had well over 100 degrees of um, background noise. The SDR bandwidth was uh, two mega greater than two megahertz. A TCXO or GPSO oscillator. 
um, SDR and processing and accurate topocentric period. Uh, now the requirements for success. So in conclusion, it is possible for amateurs to detect BO329 with less than two meters antenna. The main desire and requirement is for a low side loads and back loads. If you can afford a big dish, go for it. And understanding pulse train properties is key to identifying low signal to noise ratio pulsars in RFI and noise. The other thing I want to point out is that these techniques are applicable to low sickness noise intercepts, even for large dish systems. I've seen Presto plots for large systems, and as the sickness, as the pulsars get weaker, the uh, information is uh, is not quite so good. Okay, well that's it. Thank you guys for listening. I hope not too many have gone to sleep. Why do we care? <laughs> yeah, thank you very much, Peter. Uh, absolutely fantastic. Um, we've got some time if anybody has some questions. Um, can, I, can I ask a question, Peter? Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was uh, to Peter. Um, Obviously, you're basing the detection around all the known characteristics of a pulsar. Yes. So, is there any possibility of an amateur discovering an unknown pulsar? Highly improbable. Oh. I don't think any amateur has discovered a pulsar. Uh, most, there's been well over a, a couple of thousand pulsars discovered, and and you do need very large dishes. Uh, I don't think, no, I don't think any amateurs discovered a pulse. Okay. They've all been discovered. <laughs> so, I mean, presumably the, the algorithm, I mean, if you did a search algorithm, uh, putting all these uh, numbers into your software, you know, it would take the lifetime of the universe to go through all the possibilities, would it? <laughs> well, the, the, to be fair, the, you know, the Presto software, has got some very advanced algorithms in it. And it doesn't just search for one, it, it searches over a range of dispersion measure, um, period, um, and uh, period rate. Um, it really does a comprehensive search. And uh, they, what they do is that they, they point, uh, you find a lot of pulsars close together in globular clusters. And I, I think a lot of work has been in pointing their uh, 100 meter dishes, at globular clusters and collecting a lot of data and then spending weeks going through it. Uh, I, I think an amateur has disco discovered something. Uh, something comes to mind that um, I think a PhD student was analyzing some data that people had uh, recorded and, and found some uh, new signals in it. Brilliant. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, Peter, if I may ask a question um, concerning... I, I expected one for you, okay. <laughs> <laughs> confirmation of uh, results. Um, I think in addition to the test that you do, one of the critical tests would be repeatability. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and also uh, on target, off target. So if you have an observation, um, and you have a positive result, then that positive result should be coming uh, on, on a, let's say, on a regular basis. The difficulty with the pulsar we are talking about here is that it is a, has a high degree of scintillation. So there are days when it's weaker than there are That's days right. when yeah. it's uh, stronger. So you, uh, if you have a positive observation on one day, that's not a guarantee you have a positive observation on the next day, but over a large number of observations, you should have a clear indication that it is there. And another test would be to compare that uh, to times when you record data, but when the pulse is out of your beam. Um, so that's a, a kind of on target, off target uh, measurement. So I, I think that's that's an important additional test that one should do in order to be sure that uh, 
the signal one has is, is yeah, a valid I, signal. Yeah, I, I think that's taken uh, Wolfgang. I've taken, I've probably got a hundred days worth of, of measurements. And you're right, you know, some days I don't get anything. In fact, um, once you know that you, your system is capable of, of detecting something in a certain direction, um, I've, I've spent a lot of time on uh, records that uh, I, it, it isn't obvious and to see whether I can see something deep down. And because um, it's always there, even if you, um, uh, even if you can't see it and scintillation is low, um, over a three hour period, I've, I've never seen a three hour period where I haven't got anything. Um, I have got some other techniques that I haven't talked about, um, whereby I, um, in, as well as understand, take, having an understanding of the pulsar characteristics, I have an understanding of the noise characteristics. And if the, uh, uh, what I've discovered is that the, a lot about the noise around the pulsar and, and the characteristics of that that aren't like a, a pulsar. But I, I totally agree with you. You've got a point in the right direction. You've got to know that your system has got the right sort of sensitivity and you've got to expect several days where there's no obvious uh, pulsar there. But, I, I, but um, can you answer the, uh, that earlier question? Have, have you ever discovered a pulsar with your 25 meter dish? No, we, we have not. And I don't expect that will happen because- yeah. uh, They've all really discovered. Uh, if, I, I think they're about, uh, if you take the both Northern and the Southern Hemisphere, there are about 2000 pulsars known. Um, from those 2000 known pulsars, uh, with our dish, we have uh, collected something like 130 pulsars, which we can see. These are all known pulsars. And obviously, the, these are the stronger pulsars. Um, for the B0329, we're talking about a 200 milliansky average uh, flux density. The weakest that we have detected are in the 1 milliansky range, so substantially below that. But of course, there are many, many pulsars known, which are uh, simply beyond our capability with a 25 meter dish. And I would assume that uh, with all the surveys that have been done, um, there have been no pulsars in the, in the range of a few uh, Miliansky, which have been overlooked. It, uh, and having something um, which maybe suddenly appears somewhere, um that's uh, very unlikely to happen mm. uh, but then even for the known poles oh, let me wait make one more comment on uh, when you observe a location um and assume there might be or just uh, speculate there might be a pulsar what you don't know is you don't know the period you don't know the uh, dispersion measure so run through all that presto does a good job on doing that but uh, at the end of the day, um, if you want to detect something very weak, you maybe uh, track a location for one hour or th two hours and then run it through uh, Presto. Uh, actually, there, is, there are some uh, programs uh, which we're also using called Heimdall, which uh, runs the dispersion measure on a GPU, which is then substantially faster. But anyway, it's a lot of data. It's a lot of uh, processing. <laughs> so I, I think for the amateur, um, the more interesting approach is to look at known uh, pulsars and look what what's happening to them. Yeah. Um, scintillation in the 0329 is an interesting subject. Um, another thing, if you have the capability of looking at the grab pulsar to look at the giant pulses, that's interesting. Um, so there, there are interesting things to be done. And I think that just the challenge alone for a small dish getting. Yeah. 
you've uh, muted yourself. Wolfgang, you've muted yourself. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> Uh, I, I don't know where uh, where I left it. So I, my comment essentially is: don't expect to find new pulsars. Uh, right. you, uh, that's that's very unlikely to happen. Rather, uh, look what is out there. Um, try to confirm and look at things at the characteristics of the pulsars that that are out there, and uh, have your fun with doing that. Mm -hmm. Jolly good. I, I'm impressed though. I, I think there's been a new release. Um, they're replacing the, I don't know whether it's been replaced or the chi-square statistic with the Z2N. And the Z2N, yeah. that, that looks more at pulse shape, I think. Yeah, I haven't used the latest version. The, the, the trouble that we have um, changing the, the uh, Presto version is... Uh, Unfortunately, Presto has the observatory codes in the source code. Uh, and um, we have modified Presto, uh, identified an observatory code for us, and we have modified the source code. Uh, so we have an Astropyta Stockard specific version of Presto so that our filter bank files, the headers recognized, and everything runs smoothly. And I haven't gone through the effort of doing that over again in the latest version. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure whether that's, uh, eventually we'll do it, uh, but at the moment, it's just not the time uh, because there are other things that we are, that are of more interest to us. Yeah, more interest, so, yes, I know, yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, our, our main effort at the moment is looking at the FRBs, as you know, uh, we're, we're monitoring the FRB. Uh, we are monitoring a magnetar, which is essentially a, a similar thing as a pulsar, and we are happy with the software that we have at the moment. And uh, eventually, I'll, I will look into the later version of Presto. Good, good. Peter, um, yeah. I know your first uh, exercise uh, along this path was a hydrogen line receiver, and you set yourself a target of building a hydrogen line receiver for 200 pounds, yeah. um, which you met. Um, that was very well, or is very well documented on your website. I know we've got this video as a reference. I wondered if there's further information on your website on uh, uh, what you've been doing in, in building the system for uh, pulsar detection. Uh, yeah, there's lots. I, I, I've, I've, I've been doing this work for quite some time. Everything I've said today is on my website. Um, why in, more de in more detail. In more detail. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, can I have a question, Peter? Yep. Um, what would you do differently if you were going to start all over again from scratch? Well, my wife did say I could have a dish in the garden, and I think that's <laughs> the way I'd go. <laughs> It's a beautiful garden because she keeps it so well. Or maybe uh, I, yeah. I, I think if I could get my yagis up on the roof, I might be able to get the system noise temperature down. So, but yeah, I, I think you know if if you really want more than just one pulsar, uh, you've got to go for a dish, and it's probably got to be at least five meters, I suppose. Three to five meters. Three is probably the minimum. There have been other successful amateurs. Um, I think if you look on the web, there's um, there are several amateurs that have got who um, most of them are uh, radio amateurs who uh, come from the Earth Moon Earth um, group, and uh, so these guys really know low noise and uh, and uh, and so uh, they're quite a natural to uh, to turn their attention to pulsars i think andrea deli imagine is a ama and, and i think that's where he came from I, I guess one of the success factors is also that you have to be careful choosing your observing frequency um, obviously, as you pointed out, there is a 
maximum of the emission of O329, around 400 megahertz or so. Um, the trouble is that um, RFI situation is different in, in different locations. So I think uh, yeah, one has to analyze what is my RFI situation in, in the, at the place where I am and then choose an observing frequency. Uh, you, um, for, I mean, there's this radio astronomy band in the four, around 408. Um, we can't use it uh, at our location. It's just uh, uh, so massive uh, emissions near to that that uh, we were just are overloading our uh, LNAs. So I think that's that's something that one should start with saying, okay, well, what is my RFI situation? What frequency can I actually use? Well, that's why I chose 611, actually. Um, my RFI at nighttime is almost zero. It's only during the daytime when there are cars and, and people have electronic things going like mowing machines. And, um, but nighttime is, is got to be the best. So my best observations have been in uh, October, late September, October, November. two or three o'clock in the morning, but you know, with these electronic things, you can set them up to come on automatically and keep your fingers crossed. <laughs> I guess another aspect would be to uh, look at the bandwidth that you're using. Uh, you have chosen to use the RTLSDR, which is limited in this band with two, uh, with two megahertz. Obviously the signal to noise ratio goes by the square of the bandwidth. And then of course you're again fighting RFI, uh, so it's a sort of a compromise between using as much bandwidth as possible and on the other hand, not, not uh, collecting too much RFI. Um, have you done any experiments uh, or measurements with different uh, SDRs that have a higher bandwidth? Yes, I use, I use the Astrofine. Uh, the uh, the um, uh, oh, Airspy. Yeah, I think the Airspy, yeah. Airspy, okay. yeah. I use Airspy because you can lock that with the my GPS clock. And so that's one part in a billion frequency accuracy. Uh, the other thing I do, I, I'm, I'm using GNU now, uh, new radio. And, um, and, and so I'm getting very fine bandwidths. And so I can uh, cut out um, any bad channels quite easily now. So, but that's helped a lot. But my, my six meg R3 triple RTLs, that worked extremely well. I, I had some good data with that. Uh, what bandwidth can you get with the SPI? 10 megs. Okay. Uh, just as a side comment, um, we also tested various SDRs in the application of uh, pulsar reception, and we had some surprises. Uh, the um, one of our previous favorites in terms of SDRs was the Ada and Pluto from analog devices, which works very fine in spectral observation as a fairly flat uh, spectral response. But we've and officially it's uh, delivered something like. Uh, 50 megahertz of bandwidth, which is does which works in the, in the spectral mode, but we found that it's losing samples um, yeah. uh, relatively early, um, which uh, we didn't expect. But this is a no go for any pulsar work if it's losing mm -hmm. samples. Um, um, we don't have an air spy, but uh, we tested some others which are not as wideband. The best uh, performer today is was the Lime SDR, which gives us, well, officially it should give us 50 megahertz of bandwidth, but it's losing samples then as well. So uh, we have to had to scale down to 40 megahertz. Mm -hmm. So if anybody uh, wants to try that, uh, use a wider bandwidth uh, SDR. Uh, our present experience is that the Lime SDR works best so far, unless you go to the very expensive one, the US RPs, which are the, then in, uh, which give you 100 megahertz of bandwidth, but then you are in the 
price range of somewhere every thousand uh, pounds, I mean, a thousand pounds and, and yeah. above, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, time marches on, and I think at this point in the um. In the olden days, there would be a huge round of applause for you, Peter. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. You're very welcome. I've enjoyed it. Thank you. Um, if there are any more questions, put them in the uh, in the chat, and um, we'll make sure uh, Peter gets back to you at some stage in the future. Um, Okay, in, in conclusion today, something completely different. I'm, I'm going to hand over to Paul, Paul Hyde, who's got a couple of points that he wants to, uh, to share with us. Over to you, Paul. Right, okay. So I need to uh, share screen. And uh, we have this. Uh, I've got no sound, so I don't need to do that. So, do we have that, Paul, please? Yes, indeed, it's working. Good, thank you. Go to full screen. Um, I just wanted to say a few words about the uh, Meteor Beacon uh, project that's been sort of dotting around. Uh, Brian Coleman can't be with us tonight, so I'm going to speak uh, for him as well. But uh, just quickly running through a status report and sort of sort of explaining what's uh, what's going on. Uh, I'm sure you've all seen this uh, before, but for just in case there aren't any, we're talking about uh, meteor forward scatter, where we're using a, a beacon transmitter uh, to generate a signal and then observing meteors through radio reflections uh, off the plasma trail. Um, the idea is that we install, we build a meteor beacon in the UK. Uh, before people, or up to now, people have been using the Graves uh, uh, radar system over in France, um, which produces a very strong signal, but it has a couple of issues with it. Um, the way the radar beam scans across the sky, and also we have absolutely no idea of the incident power on the plasma stream of the meteor. Um, so that really makes detailed scientific analysis sort of a bit pointless or whatever. So the idea is to establish our own beacon um, within the amateur radio six meter band to illuminate these plasma trails. I'm gonna say, I've got a slide about the choice of frequency later on. So uh, I'll just uh, cover that later. Um, second part is to, well, second and third part is a network of um, uh, receiver sites actually making observation on these plasma trails. Uh, so one would be a small number of web SDRs in radio quiet locations and with a decent uh, antenna system so as to produce the best possible uh, reception. Uh, and that would provide data that's available over the internet for those who um, don't enjoy those particular circumstances to get some decent data for, for work they want to do. Otherwise, it's um, uh, supplementing those web SDRs with uh, individual receivers uh, installed by sort of both radio and optical observers. And there is a lot of interest amongst the guys, girls and guys that monitor um, uh, meteors with um, uh, camera systems, uh, they're interested in meteors. They're not too bothered about which part of the electromagnetic spectrum the information comes from. So there are a couple that have already uh, 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 put um, uh, uh, radio-based uh, uh, um, ob observatories in place. And then finally, the whole question about um, analyzing the data. Um, the thing about radio networks is that It'll be, it should be a hundred times more sensitive than the, um, the camera, the optical systems, and uh, also offer 10 times more cross-correlation opportunities. I mean, basically with radio, uh, you're not bothered whether it's day or night, you're not bothered whether there's cloud cover, and you're not bothered whether the other two or three stations that observations you're trying to cross-correlate with have 
identical uh, clear sky conditions, clear and nighttime uh, conditions. So a huge number of extra events um, that are possible, um, a lot more sensitive. So that's a whole range of uh, meteors which are not accessible to the optical networks. Uh, so some distinct advantages there. Uh, the sort of things talking about doing with the data, um, the first couple are pretty much what people do already with graphs and such. That's looking at meteor activity and, and looking at the radio spectrograms that are produced, um, uh, uh, showing uh, the way in which um, uh, meteors uh, uh, break up into plasma trails, etc. Number three is meteor SIDS. That's looking at whether uh, meteors can dump enough plasma into the ionosphere to actually affect the reception of VLF um, radio signals. Um, and then uh, number four onwards, these are in ascending order of difficulty. Number four onwards, um, where we start to match uh, radio events with those recorded on the optical networks. We tried to do this three or four years ago and were beaten by the Graves beam scanning um, system because uh, uh, the Graves beams span across the sky over uh, 4.8 seconds. So we don't see a radio event until it's actually illuminated. So if you've got uh, seconds uh, of uncertainty there, it's, it just proved uh, almost impossible to get um, correlation between video events, which are sort of time stamped to within 100 milliseconds or less, and, and radio events that could be anywhere within a, a four or five second window. So uh, our own um, uh, meteor beacon gets over that problem. Uh, second set, ionization profile, um, that's to be able to sort of measure the uh, uh, intensity of the reflection coming off different parts of the trail, but uh, as seen by individual observers, um, and create uh, and combine those observations to get an ionization profile. Number six is really important uh, establish meteor trajectories. Um, that's something which has been possible with the optical networks, but with the radio networks, as I say, there's those extra couple of magnitudes as regards sensitivity which produces a huge uh, number, uh, additional number of events that uh, could, be, um, could be analyzed and tracked. Uh, determine meteor flux. Um, this is getting quite sophisticated now because there's so many variable factors involved, but um, it, it is a really key part of understanding um, uh, how meteors affect um, uh, our uh, ionosphere um, a space, local space environment and, and beyond. And number eight is uh, very speculative and um, difficult to do, which is to try and um, look at HF high frequency emissions from the plasma trail itself, um, from turbulence within the plasma. Uh, issues, well, obviously we've got to get approval for that um, uh, beacon. We've got to find a location for it. We've got to source the transmitter equipment We've got to um, <laughs> pay for the transmitter is one thing. Uh, it's going to be more difficult finding the uh, the money to pay the electricity bill year in year out. So that has to be approached. We uh, establish the receiving network, which you know hopefully we're looking for fifty or sixty stations in that network, and then develop the analysis analysis methodology and all the IT stuff that's needed to support that. Uh, where are we today? Well, Ben Coleman really sort of kicked this one off. Um, so he's been working with uh, a bunch of uh, uh, amateurs, the uh, six meter group, uh, to submit a, a proposal to Ofcom for the beacon transmitter. We have a high confidence um, that we're there, that the only major thing that's holding us up on that is not being able to say where the beacon would be located. Um, uh, otherwise, I think we're in a situation where we could put that application in and, as I say, a high confidence that it would be approved. Uh, Brian and, uh, and a friend of his, Mark Frito, they're developing a proof of concept on these web 
uh, software defined radio receivers to be able to deliver um, uh, data across the internet to whoever wants it. Uh, Brian's also developing the beacon transmitter um, and looking at um, sources for purchasing the, the, the equipment, uh, the hardware behind it. And then thanks to Norman Pomfret, um, we got an invite to BT Madley, which is uh, up at Hereford. So that's the BT's main uh, earth station, satellite earth station. And the local manager there is very uh, amenable to hosting the beacon, uh, at least on a proof of concept basis. Um, so he, he does need head office approval. So that's the next stage. I mean, this guy is so helpful that uh, we mentioned the electricity bill and he, he just sniffed <laughs> a mere nothing for that side. So that's, that's really uh, encouraging. Um, just to give you an idea of what we're talking about, um, there's a, a, net, um, a meteor network over in Belgium, Brahms. This is their original transmitting antenna. So very simple, uh, two, two, two element Yagis, cross Yagis. Uh, they did move on to this, which is something that uh, we would like to do uh, eventually. Uh, this is the transmitter. See the uh, degree of sophistication and the enormous racks of equipment needed. So basically, we've got um, something to create the uh, the radio signal, something to discipline it as far as uh, frequency is concerned, and a blooming great amplifier um, to um, to give us the necessary oomph um, on a twenty four hour a day, uh, seven day a week basis. A um, few pictures of Norman and I's trip up to BT Madley. Um, it's a huge site. Uh, they've got 65 dishes on that site. Um, some of them, uh, three of them, 32 meter diameter dishes. There's a lot of infrastructure. And so even though it's a large site, actually finding a location uh, is not so easy, but this might be one possibility, except um, there are large structures nearby which might modify the um, uh, transmitter beam pattern. Um, they're so helpful at Madley, they've identified places, accommodation for equipment. So um, this might be a more amenable site. These three dishes here are um, uh, redundant. Um, so that's these three dishes here. So that might be a location. Um, so, so that was good. If it were at Madley and based on advice from the Brahms team over in Belgium, um, they're looking, I mean, they're doing some very detailed uh, research uh, into the weaker, the under dense meteors, which are far more predictable as regards uh, the level of the reflected signal. Um, and they reckon that um, they get good results off a 200 kilometer radius um, distance, which is the red circle. Um, the blue circle is 300 kilometers, just for reference. Uh, Brian Coleman is receiving meteor reflections off the Belgian beacon at a distance of 450 kilometers, which would be the entire image here. Now, um, those are very weak reflections, and I'm not sure uh, as to the amount of science that we can get off those. So um, uh, sort of uh, category one area would be in red. And, and, and well, my wet finger in the air is, uh, is maybe the 300 kilometer uh, radius. Um, uh, it would be nicer to have a location somewhere towards the center of the country. And if anyone can sort of um, uh, get an invite and uh, whatever on that, um, that would we definitely look at it. Um, but the thing about uh, Madley is that um, free electricity, the, um, the helpfulness of the guys there, um, it's only on a proof of concept and it would need to be portable so that we could remove it at short notice if it's going to cause any, them any problems. Uh, but those same characteristics give us the ability to move to a new location if we find uh, an offer in the future. And if we get some good results under our belt, um, then we've got a, a stronger case to make on all fronts, whether it be funding or accommodation for the meteor or whatever. So that's the logic. Uh, as far as receivers are concerned, 
this is a typical receiving antenna uh, used at the Brahms stations at three element Yagi. Note it's pointing directly upwards, which is a modification of their original strategy. Um, they found that the antenna pattern is a lot easier to, uh, to model when it's like this, but also you can rotate the whole antenna system to minimize uh, local noise. So um, uh, I want to do, well, I am doing a little bit of investigation uh, because high gain antennas are not what we want. Um, I'm exploring uh, maybe uh, uh, what's known as a Moxon design um, to give the, um, which is a, 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 a bit smaller than this, but also has less uh, eye poking out um, uh, uh, properties um, than, than, than the Yagi. So thinking of practical things like that. This is the receiver that um, the Bram system use. Uh, there's that Air Spy receiver again. So um, uh, this sort of receiver, the ability to discipline it on, in terms of frequency, you know, is very useful. And they're not that much more expensive than the Funky dongle, which a lot of people use. Um, they also use a calibrator unit to give precise uh, amplitude uh, and uh, 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 GPS uh, uh, source for timing. And it's all run uh, on uh, a Raspberry Pi, um, software and a Raspberry Pi. And if you use that as your standard Swiss Army knife of dimensions, you, you realize this whole thing is, is not that large. So there we go. Uh, I think that's my last slide. Uh, right. Oh, no, I did. Yes, importantly. Um, there was a bit of, there is a bit of discussion about choice of frequency. Um, Jean-Louis uh, Ralt uh, made a comment that he thought we should be going into new grounds rather than repeating what uh, the Brahms people have done. Um, going back on the history of this, the whole idea got kicked off from one of our very early meetings, I presume meetings, might have been number two, it was the one where we were discussing meteor scatter. Um, and uh, there was a comment in that meeting that graphs really is too high a frequency um, for good meteor work. Um, this is based on the, really the power that's reflected from a plasma trail is proportional to the wavelength cubed. So if you compare 150 megs with 50 megs, a factor of three, then you'll get 27 times more oomph down at 50 megs uh, than you do at 143 megs. So that, that's a great incentive to use the, the 50 meg uh, frequency band and is uh, probably the main reason why uh, the Brahms team chose uh, that part of the spectrum. Uh, one issue uh, is that Doppler shifts down at 50 megs will only be a third of those at 150 megs. So if you're looking at stuff um, for uh, and the way in which it breaks, in, in which it divides up in frequency terms, then that is uh, a, a disadvantage. So it's, it's mulling these two over. And um, I'm, I'm strongly of the opinion that we need to continue on with the six meg, um, uh, six meter approach. Um, at the moment, we don't know whether a low power two meter beacon, so we're not going to be able to generate, we'll never get approval um, uh, in the amateur radio band for a high power beacon. So um, uh, we'll be losing that 27 times advantage uh, in terms of um, reflected power. Um, and at the moment, I'm sure that we can get reflections at two meters, and I'm actually doing some personal monitoring myself just to see what it's like. Um, and at the moment I've had absolutely zilch, but it's early days. Um, but certainly there's no, there's no hard and fast evidence to say that if we go for a two meter beacon at low power that we'll see anything. So that's a question mark, which I'm sure will be resolved in the future, but it's an unknown at the moment. Um, the science objectives that I referred to earlier, those are based upon the Brahms network. Um, uh, which operates at 50 megs. So, you know, that's a proven concept. And that's going to be so much easier um, to 
um, uh, to go to various organizations for money and for support and whatever uh, by removing an um, uh, the, the uncertainty. And the other thing is, and, and I'm really keen on this, 90% of this project is going to be in the receiver network and the analysis process and the people behind all that. Um, uh, the only frequency dependent component really is the antenna, the receive antenna, because if you have a, say an SPI or another SDR receiver, it's all, it, it, it covers a huge frequency range. So the only thing you need to do, if you decide after um, doing investigations that there is value at 140 megs, the only thing you need to change is the antenna. Um, and you can blooming well cut down if, um, um, a um, <clears throat> 50 megs antenna to do the same. So I, I think it's, it's, low, it's low risk. Uh, this is the final slide. Um, so what we need to do now, we need to support uh, BT Madley for them to get uh, head office approval. We need to apply for the bike beacon license. We need to fund uh, the beacon infrastructure and we're getting positive some positive signs on that. It's it's not we, at this point we are shall we say quietly confident. Um, uh, and then there's a lot of work to be do, done on sort of developing the science case and also getting the team together to work with the optical observers and other interested parties um, to to develop ideas for the receiving stations. And that's going to be an objective for the next couple of weeks. Um, and uh, if anybody's interested in taking part in this, then um, please let me or Paul Hearn know, we'll pass it on to me or whatever, and we'll get a Zoom conference event together and uh, start to tie down some of these uh, items. So perhaps at this point, I should just ask for if there are any questions on what, follow, um, on, on what I've just described. Uh, have you had any other sort of offers of sites arising from perhaps local astronomy societies more centrally into the Midlands? Uh, no, um, there has been a suggestion that perhaps the um, National Space Centre at Leicester might be interested, but um, to be honest, um, I really need inside links and whatever. Um, uh, Norman Pomfret was so helpful in getting it set up with BT Madley. Um, and um, uh, I, from my position, I think the offer of support from BT Madley and the fact it's going to be a portable installation is, is too good to miss. And we should pursue this. Um, but if there are other opportunities, then by all means, but mm -hmm. need help in establishing contacts. One thing I should notice, uh, mention, is that this is a transmitting antenna. Um, the electromagnetic field is not going to be that great. It's only 100 watts, but there are still regulations as regards um, public access uh, or even sort of um, professional access. But we're talking about a small number of meters here. But it would mean that um, such a beacon, the antenna, would need to be in an area that uh, didn't have public access. Yeah. So the looking at your map, um, the logical next development would be one sited somewhere around Glasgow or Edinburgh. Uh, if you mean in addition, in addition, yes, I, I quite mm. agree. Um, in Belgium, they do have two beacons one at the south um, uh, border and one at the north border. Um, they did have ideas about using both of them, um, but um, practically that proved not so useful in terms of receive antennas. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, the more beacons, the merrier, but let's just start off with one. Mm. Any more questions? Uh, uh, I have a technical question concerning the choice of frequencies. Um, is there any benefit going even lower than 50 megahertz if, of course, spectrum would be available and, and uh, so on? Yes, there are advantages in going lower and there are advantages in going higher, depending on what you want to look at. 
uh, uh, as Jean Lee Ralt uh, suggested, if you if you want if you want stuff that's got high Doppler shift, then what about four hundred and thirty megs? Um, I I I, uh, I think you're getting into pretty sophisticated stuff then. But um, uh, coming down in frequency, you're definitely going to become more sensitive. The only problem, well, uh, one of the problems is going to be increasing noise uh, levels as you come down, and also uh, uh, as uh, uh, as you suggest, Wolfgang, uh, regulatory approval. Um, the short waves tend to be pretty tightly thought over. Right. Thank you very much. And uh, hopefully um, your uh, people will get in touch with expressions of interest or whatever in, in following how we, uh, how we do. Um, the next item is the, is separately. Yes, good. So um, come October, we've got the annual meeting uh, uh, of, of the group. Saturday the 16th of October. So this year it's going to be a Zoom event uh, again. Uh, depending on interest, we uh, can explore uh, YouTube possibilities or whatever, but that's the plan at the moment. We've got our keynote speakers lined up. Um, uh, Ian McCarty is going to be talking about X-ray cosmology and um, Spencer Exani about uh, counting muons. Um, this is, this is based uh, purely on the idea of um, um, uh, interest and popularity and whatever. Um, uh, to my mind, uh, the group is based on the electromagnetic spectrum, um, uh, except the optical band, uh, which allows a certain amount of space, plus anything else that needs a soldering iron and putting things together and doing things practically. So um, um, that, uh, uh, that cosmic watch looks really interesting. Um, but to supplement those, I'm really keen for people to um, uh, 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 submit bits of uh, uh, presentations that I've, they've done, you know, maybe just 20 minutes or 30 minutes or even a five minute poster. Um, it's three and a half minutes, three and a half months away. Um, give a thought. We've had a couple of extra offers already. Um, uh, but I'm not going to panic until September. Um, but have a thought, have a think about what you can do or whatever. Um, uh, explore Peter East's site and uh, look at that um, hydrogen line uh, instrument, which is uh, an order of less um, um, uh, complexity, but or even go for uh, uh, the sort of thing that uh, Peter has been uh, describing tonight. And, um, set yourself or the local club a challenge in doing something like that, um, uh, or uh, applying uh, GNU radio. We're not looking for huge things. We're looking for individual sub uh, subjects that will uh, encourage others um, to partake, uh, partake in the um, uh, in the subject. So um, please let me know if you have any suggestions or offers of a, a potential uh, presentation um, for, for October. And that's my bit. Okay. Um, yeah, thanks very much, Paul. That, that was great. Um, that then, uh, well, just before we conclude, does anybody have a, a, a question or a comment? before I close off. Absolutely brilliant. <laughs> here, here. Yeah. Um, thank you very much again, Peter and Paul, uh, for your comments. We'll gather again on Resume on um, July the 23rd. E. Callisto is the topic. And um, it looks as if there will be a follow-up to our Python training in August, and that will be a Q&A session. So where you've been um, puzzling over implementing Rupert Powell's um, uh, workshop ideas in your own labs, then there will be an opportunity to 
uh, post a question beforehand and the session will be based on pre-submitted questions. Um, Python oriented, of course. So um, until next time, take care and good night one and all.